Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Good to have you with me once again on Sunday morning. Um, I was thinking this week about several things, and one of the thoughts that crossed my mind <clears throat> regarding all of us that gather together here at the Digital Cathedral, if you've been with me for any length of time, I hope, I trust, that you have grown in your relationship with the Father through the Son in the Spirit past the point where you are living for Jesus. Most of us started our spiritual journey at that place because uh, we accepted Jesus into our heart, and so we began to live for Jesus. The problem with living for Jesus is it makes a dualism. It's a separation of you and him. Now, as we matured, we matured, but we also kept a dualism, and we began to live a life, especially if you came through charismatic circles, word of faith circles, that, he, that Jesus was living through us. Both of those are very works-oriented. Whether you're living for Jesus, Jesus living through you, when he was living through us, it still brings the dualism. It still brings him and me being separated. I hope you've come to a place in your, in your life, in your walk, that you understand that Jesus is living as you and you are living as him. There's one. It's a union with distinction. You still have your personality. You still have your little idiosyncrasies. But as far as being in the spirit, living that life out, you're beginning to live, as John said, as Jesus is in this present world. Now, I could say a lot about those, those three dimensions, living for Jesus, Jesus living through you, or you living what I like to call the Christ is us life, because there is one life, one, one source, one mind, and now you've entered into that place. And here's why it's important. This is what I want to get into this morning. It's important that you progress up to that point because your focus changes. Your perception, your awareness changes entirely when you understand that you're living the Christ is us life. In fact, that verse that we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18 that says, we, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are temporary, or they're passing away, they change, they fluctuate, they're subject to change. We don't look at those things. Our focus changes. And we looked at the things that are not seen, because the things that are not seen are eternal, they're unchangeable, they're fixed. Now somebody asked me, why is it so important that we look at the things that are not seen? Why is it important that we take uh, our focus off of the things that we see, the surroundings, the circumstances, the situations, uh, all the little dilemmas and ups and downs that life throws us. Why is it important that we not look at those things? There is a reason we don't look at uh, or give attention to all the things that try to get our attention that come through our five physical senses, come through the surrounding circumstances, uh, life situations. There's a reason we don't do that. And here's the answer to the question that the person asked me when they said, why is it important that we don't look at the things that are seen? Here's, here's the reason. Because whatever you focus on, you empower. Whatever you focus on, you empower. Like I told a friend of mine, I said, the reason I have such a big Jesus and you have such a big devil that you're fighting all the time is because our focus is different. Whatever you give your attention to and your awareness to is going to be empowered. Now, when you give your focus and attention to an evil report or negative circumstances, what you're doing, whether you realize it or not, and, and we've lived our life like this, we are empowering those circumstances. We're empowering those perceptions. You empower the evil report and the circumstance, and what that does in your life, here's where the stress comes from. Here's where the fear and the anxiety comes from, is because we focus on the things that we see. That's why Paul said we don't look at the things that are seen because we don't want to empower that which has no power. And the more you focus on it, the more power that it has. I was thinking about, remember in the Old Testament when uh, Moses sent out the 12 spies to spy out the promised land? He sent one person, one man from every tribe, 12 tribes, 12 spies. And they went out and they looked at and surveyed the promised land, the land that God promised to give them. And they came back with a report. Ten came back with a report and said, we can't go. We can't take it. 
There's giants in the land. There's the Hittites, the Hivites, the Canaanites. All the ites are in the land and it's too much for us. But there were two guys, Joshua and Caleb, that said, we're able to do it. We can take it. Let's go up and let's do it right now. What was the difference between the report of the 10 and the report of the 12? The report of the 10 were looking at the circumstances, the surroundings, the situation, where Joshua and Caleb they observed the same situation, the same giants, the same heights, but they were focused on what they could not see, which was the promise that God gave them that they could possess the land. So when you empower what is seen, what it requires then, and this is why we spend so much time battling the devil, when you empower that which is seen, it requires that you ask a greater power, which for most of us was God, we ask the greater power to come defeat this lesser power that we empowered that had no power. So when you stop looking at the things that are seen and you stop empowering those, those circumstances, the report from the doctor or what you see with your physical eyes, but you're beginning to look in another dimension, which you're able to because you're living a Christ is us life. You're no longer, there's no longer the dualism. There's no, no longer you and the Father, you and the Son, you and the Spirit of truth. But what Jesus said in John 14, 20, and that, that day, and I think that day is now, you'll know that I am, Jesus said, in the Father, and that you are in me, and I'm in you. So there is a union that is going on, and that changes our focus, that changes our perception. Now, there's the distinction in verse 18, in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, that I quoted. Paul said, we don't look at the things that are seen. We look, at the, we look at the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are temporary, things that are eternal, that unseen are eternal. So what we're talking about is two kingdoms, two dimensions. We're talking about the seen, the unseen. We're talking about the natural and the spiritual. We're talking about the kingdom that God has given to us and the kingdoms of this world. So if you're going to live the Christ is us life, you have to make a choice which kingdom you're going to focus on. Every one of us need to make this decision. And I, I think we're coming to that T in the road when you've got to make a choice which one you're going to focus on, which one is going to empower, which one are you going to empower? Because whichever kingdom you focus on, you're going to empower. Which one are you going to make your reality? Which one are you going to make your source? Now, there's some folks that live pretty well out of the seeing kingdom. They've learned how to, how to function, how to, uh, how to manipulate, how to move in that, that dimension, and that's all fine. But I'm here to tell you this morning, there's a greater reality for you and for me, and that is the same kingdom that Jesus lived out of is available to every one of us. Jesus didn't live by the seen. He lived by the unseen. In fact, he said this. Let me, let me give you a verse about Jesus and then what Jesus said about us. Here's what Jesus said, John chapter 18 and verse 36. Jesus said flat out, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, if my kingdom were of what you see, what you perceive, uh, if my kingdom were of the circumstantial evidences, he said my servants would fight because I'd have to gain some control in that kingdom so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now he said, my kingdom is not from here. Jesus was living and traveling on an entirely different dimension than the scene. Here's what Jesus said about us, John chapter 17, that prayer that Jesus prayed for us. In John chapter 17, let me pick it up with verse 14. And I'm, just, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on this. I just want you to see that the kingdom Jesus functioned in, which was not the kingdom of this world, is the same kingdom that he prayed for us that we would function, that we would see the validity of and begin to focus on that and draw our resource from that. He says, verse 14, John 17. This is his prayer. Jesus said, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. So Jesus tells us right up front in that 14th verse that our, our kingdom, our world should not be of the scene, of that dimension. So he's beginning to raise our, raise our awareness, raise our perception. He says, they are not of the world just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. The evil one is what you see. It's your perception. It's, it's what we have empowered that has no power. 
right? So Jesus has said, I, I don't want you to take, I, I'm, I don't want them to come out of the world, but I want you to help them get focused on the kingdom that I also live in. So Jesus is saying we're going to live in two dimensions at one time. Jesus had his feet on terra firma, walked the planet just like you and I walk. But his focus, where he put his focus, was not on the seen dimension. He goes on to say in verse 16, they are not of the world just as I'm not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them, separate them. That's what the word sanctify means. It means to separate. Separate them by your truth. The more truth that you and I discover, the more we understand we're not living in this dimension. That's not our place. That's not our home. That's not where our strength is. That's the point. That's not where our strength is. We were not designed to live out of this world. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So the same power, the same ability, the same insight that Jesus has, he's endued us with. That's why I come back to it's important. No longer you're living for Jesus. He isn't living through you. That's duality. That's separation. That's still him and me. He's brought us to a place where he says we're living in union. We're living as one. Father sent me. I send you. I'm in you. You're in me. The Father's in us. Now, there's a couple problems that we have, that we have learned to uh, live with that we need to adjust. One of the biggest ones is this. We're very highly developed in living at the unseen through the lens of the seen. That's why it's so mysterious to us. We're trying to understand that which you cannot see by that which you see. We're trying to understand that which is invisible by our intellect, by our logic, by our reason. And it's not the, that it's not the kingdom. That's not what we're experiencing. So what so what that what that what that that presents a big problem. Here's the problem. Because we're trying to understand the unseen through what we see, and we've been highly developed in that, that's why it seems so mysterious, it seems so uh, illogical to us. And it's it's made us make some bad decisions. For example, when God is doing something and it doesn't make sense to what we see. For, for, for example, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14, John says that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now we look at that. Is everybody experiencing that? No, absolutely not. So we look at that statement that John made that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And we try to understand that by what we see. We look around people. We go, they're acting like they're acting crazy. They're acting foolish. They're, they're acting like anything but whole. They're acting like anything but children of God. So we're trying to understand what John said. He's the Savior of the world by what we see. And so we come to the conclusion that he's not the Savior of the world because we empower that which we see, which are the lives of people that are not matching what John said is objective reality and objective truth. Now you've come to a place. We've worked on this together for a long time. We've come to a place where our eyes are open to a pure grace message, a finished work of the cross. We've come to a place where you understand that your authentic identity is image and likeness of God. Your authentic identity is divinity or partaker of the divine nature. So now you're at a place, and I've said all that to say this. You're at a place where, you're going, where you are beginning to transition in our mind, in our awareness, our consciousness, our perception, we're beginning to make a transition. You are a transitional generation. Let me explain. There's been no other generation, I don't think, in Christianity up to this point that we're prepared to begin to live out of the unseen, out of the spirit, as, as a mass of people. There have been individuals there have been some individuals in days gone by that have tapped into this, but now there's a grassroots movement it's taking place worldwide. We're beginning to see what we've never seen. We're beginning to understand what we never understood. And so out of, out of that unseen kingdom, out of the kingdom that we have been programmed since birth to believe is real, <laughs> which is that kingdom of the seen, the kingdom of the natural. 
Now you're this generation that's all of a sudden making this transition. You're beginning to see, wait a minute, there's more to this than what I was ever taught. And it started by you deconstructing some old line sacred cow beliefs like eternal conscious torment, uh, edemic nature, you're born in sin. No, you weren't. You were born as a, as a child of God. So as we've, as we've deconstructed, as we begin to see some things, we're moving into a place where now we can begin to, to live out of the kingdom of the unseen, the above, which is, which is higher than the natural. I, I taught you above the line, below the line. We're starting now to say, okay, we can live above the line. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated with the Father. Seek that which you cannot see. Jesus lived out of the supply of the unseen. Jesus lived above the natural. Jesus walks over to the tomb of Lazarus. Martha and Mary call and say, hey, our brother is sick. Jesus waited three days, he died. He gets to the tomb. He's not living in the death of Lazarus. That's what he saw. He saw it and he wept. But he was not living out of that realm. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came forth. Jesus wasn't living in the realm of the waves and the wind when the disciples in the boat came to Jesus who was asleep in the back of the boat and said, don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus gets up, walks to the front of the boat and says, peace be still. He wasn't living out of, out of what you could see. The disciples were, but Jesus wasn't. Jesus died and rose again so that all of us, all of us, all of us, all men might have total access to the same kingdom that is an eternal, perfect supply for every need that arises. When Jesus is at the tomb, the need that arose was to have life. Jesus is in the boat, the wind and the waves. The need that arose was to have peace. Peace be still. And that's what Jesus ministered. This is the kingdom in which the will of God has been totally completed. And now we're bringing that kingdom into the earth. Heaven is invading earth, and you're the generation that is making it so. In that kingdom that is flooding the earth, you have never been sick, never been diseased. There's no death. There's never one day that you were broken that kingdom. See, there's no needs of any kind in that kingdom. Jesus lived in that, walked in it, manifested it for everybody to see the fruit, the visible manifestation on earth in this dimension of a life that totally drew its resources from the invisible, from the unseen. Are you, are you still tracking with me? That unseen is where we can say it's finished, it's complete, there's nothing lacking. Even as it was for Adam in the garden. When God set Adam into the garden, he set everything into the garden that Adam would ever need. Right? Are you, do you understand that? There was nothing Adam needed in the garden. And the Father has continued that for us. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to choose my words carefully here because I realize this is shocking. Maybe some of you here this morning at the Digital Cathedral. Here's what, here's what I'm trying to say. Because the garden was complete for Adam. The unseen is complete for us. The Father is not in the business of answering requests today. He's not in the business of, of, of answering your prayers. He's in the business of opening your eyes to what you already have and making what you already have your focus, empowering that which you already have. We're going to continue to come down this track of bringing the unseen into the seen, the invisible into the visible, because that's where we're living now. We're living as Jesus lived. He is living your life. You're living his life. Here's, here's, here's what, here's two, two, two great powerful scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's what God would say about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. For all of the promises 
of God in him are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. So you, you don't have to stand on the promises. How many promises did you stand, stand on back in your church days? I'm just standing on the promise, brother. I'm standing on it. No, 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 no. See, what you're saying is the promise isn't completed yet. And what Paul said is that every promise in God is yes and amen. It means it's finished. It's completed. It's done. So you, whatever he has promised, you don't have to pray for it to be so because it already is so. And then you know those verses in 2 Peter chapter 1. I, I, let, let me just read them so I, I make sure I get the right wording down in the right order because it really is ex extremely powerful. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says this, As his divine power has given to us everything, all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him. What we're doing at the digital cathedral, what we do at the secret place, and I'm carrying over into the now television network, is we're, we're bringing the knowledge of him. As the knowledge of him increases, we begin to see more clearly that we do have everything that pertains to life and godliness. I don't have to bawl and squall and beg and plead God to, to meet a need, to pay the rent, to get the car payment. He's already said, I have supplied every need that you're ever going to have. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches that have already been established, already been created according to his riches in glory. So the needs have already been met. So let me just say it again. God's not in the business of answering requests. What he's in the business of is opening the eyes of humanity to what they've always possessed and didn't know it, to who they've always been and had no clue to it. What are you going to ask for? that is not covered by the promises of God that he's already said yes. What are you going to ask for that is outside of everything pertaining to life and godliness? What, what could you ask for that's not covered there? What he's done is this. He's taken the, the totality of supply and pushed it to your side of the table. He's saying, look, I've, already, I've got it completed right here. It all belongs to you. Now, if you live in the unseen where everything is done and it's at work 24-7 to make it so in the seen, even if it doesn't appear to be working, it is working. And what, I'm, what, I, what we need to do, make sure we don't do, what we did for years was to negate it by empowering what we see. If you take your focus off what he has provided in the unseen, the kingdom, didn't Jesus say, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you? Here's the realization we've got to come to. We have to come to a place where we understand that the unseen is more powerful than the seen. And we have not lived that way. The seen has presented itself and we've empowered it. And we've programmed ourselves to it. And so we've had, to, we've had to try to work our way around and get God to help us not empower or disempower, if I can say, if that's a word, that which we've empowered. All you see was created from what you don't see. It says in Hebrews chapter 11. It's exactly what Hebrews chapter 11 says. Hebrews... Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 3. See, I, I, let me say it again. I can't emphasize it enough. You're the generations making this transition out of the source that we live from. And when we come into that place of abundant source in the kingdom, I'm telling you, you'll never have a need that's not met. You'll never have a sick day because, because that's the dimension we were designed to live in. We have lived so far below our standard. I used to hear that back in charismatic days that we don't know who we are, but they never told us who we are. I'm telling you who you are. I'm telling you the dimension that we can live out of. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds, worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things that are invisible. Listen, listen to me, Digital Cathedral people. The unseen is more powerful than the seen. The unseen is the source. So living the Christ is us life. Living this life of union with the Father through the Son and the Spirit 
is making that transition into the kingdom that really is true, the unseen. And embracing the reality of that kingdom as our source. I ran into a verse this week that I'm going to blow your theology. I'm going to, I'm going to blow your mind this morning. We're talking out of living out of the unseen. We're talking about um, everything you see being made out of what you don't see. Everything, everything that you can look around and see was one day non-existent, but it came as an idea from somebody. Here's a verse from Proverbs. Let's, I want you to catch this. This, this. this can change your life. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 12, out of the King James Version. And why the other versions change, I don't know. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 12, out of the King James. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. All the witty inventions are in the unseen. How many witty inventions do you think it would make, it would take for you to live a life of total financial independence? Just what, how would you like, had like, how would you have liked to have the witty invention of a, a post-it? Simple thing with glue on it, you stick it on the wall and you got notes. Paper clip, staple. I mean, witty inventions belong to you as as a son and daughter of God. See, we, we, we thought, well, I, I just got to exist on a paycheck. I got to work for somebody. My, my father worked, my grandfather. We, you know, we all worked with it. either the sweat of our brow or the strength of our back. And we just got a paycheck every week. And we made, look, I'm telling you that in the unseen is a realm of abundance and prosperity. And I'm not talking about the prosperity message. I'm talking about what rises up from within you as you focus on the unseen. Witty inventions will begin to arise. With these things in mind, what I, okay, that's my introduction this morning. With everything that I've told you so far, I want to ask you three questions. And I want you really to settle. I want you to think about this. Don't, don't answer these haphazardly. In fact, you may want to think about them this week. We're renewing our minds. We're beginning to change our focus. So let me go back to the question that the person asked me this week. Why is it important that we don't look at the unseen? Because whatever you focus on, you empower. I want you to focus on what you don't see, but what the kingdom involves. What's involved in the kingdom, the resources of the kingdom. Witty inventions are one resource of the kingdom. All right, I want to ask you three questions this morning. Are you ready? Question number one is this. Do you believe that God has, is, or ever will withhold anything that is good from you? Will God withhold good from you? He can't. He can't. The fathers cannot withhold because he's already made the decision to give you all things. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, How will he not with Christ freely give us all things? What he does for one person, he'll do for everybody. What he does for one person, he is bound to do for all. He doesn't have favorites. He doesn't have those that he has predestined, predesigned, preordained to have a step up on anybody else. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. Let me read uh, this verse of Scripture to you this morning. Matthew chapter 5, way at the start of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 says this. That you may be sons in that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. No distinction. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. Makes absolutely no distinction. When you live in the same kingdom, you're looking at that guy and say, why, why is he got, why is, why is he getting it and I'm not getting it? Why is that person seem to be blessed? He's not, he's not living a good life like I am. See, you're living by what you see. You, you're trying to weigh out, well, I'm, I'm a good guy. I, I you know, help people. I, I try to live a good life. And that guy over there looking at him. No, he makes the rain to fall on the just, the unjust, and the sun to shine on the good and, and the evil. Now, this was written pre-cross. 
This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, pre-cross. I want you to keep that in mind. I'm going to make a couple of statements, but keep that in mind. In the kingdom, in the unseen, what he does for one person in the unseen, he has fully completed and done for every single person. Now, in this verse, here, this is my opinion. I, I can't tell you this is God said. This is my opinion. The just in that verse was Jesus. This is pre-cross. The rain fell on the just and the unjust. The just in that verse is Jesus, and the unjust is the rest of us. He makes as much Jesus rain fall on you as he did Jesus. Now, post-cross, we're all just. We're all righteous. We're all in union with him. We're all perfect in his sight. So raise your focus, people. Raise your focus. Raise what you're looking at. Raise your, 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 your awareness to what the Father has provided for you through the Son, His blessings, His healing, His freedom. It's not just for a select few. It's for all of us. By His fatherhood nature, He cannot withhold, but He must freely give us. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He's given you Christ, and with Christ, He has freely given you everything. When you got Jesus, you got the package, brother. And you didn't pick him, he picked you. If one died for all, all died. You buried with him, you resurrected with him from death to life to newness of life. There's nobody that has a, has a leg up on you. In fact, Peter said this in, uh, what is it, Acts chapter 10, long about verse 34. He said, I perceive that there is no partiality with God. So you, you need to agree this morning. You need to get your focus on what he has freely given. Get your awareness up there. Your unity in spirit with him has got to become your reality. All right, question number two. Do you believe that God could give you what you need, but right now he's chosen not to give it to you? He could do it, but he's chosen not to do it. I'm not talking about all your little fleshly wants. You know, I saw, I saw a Bentley convertible the other day. I looked at Bentley convertible. I said, that's got to have my name on it. You know, I'm a car guy. I like cars. I said, that Bentley con convertible has to have my name on it. And I was just, just kidding. He, he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, right? That Bentley convertible is not part of what I need for life and godliness. Now, I may have a Bentley convertible one day. I don't know. I haven't really had an urge. It looked nice. But it's not what I'm telling you is in the unseen. I'm not prompted to bring that from the unseen to the seen. Now, if the Father prompts me to get that Bentley convertible, I'm, I'm telling you what, I'll develop that in my imagination. I'll let it grow in my heart until out of the abundance of heart my mouth will speak. And if, I, if it gets that point, I'm telling you, the Bentley's mine. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Here's what we're talking about. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Let me read down through verse 32. Therefore I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat or what you drink or about your body, what you're going to put on. See, that's all visibility. That's all what you see. That's where you don't focus. This is what he's getting at. You don't focus there. Is not your life more than food, the body more than clothing? He said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap. Oh boy, there goes that sowing and reaping that we heard so much about in Word of Faith days. He said, they don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, yet your Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Which of you by worrying could add one, one cubit to his stature? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus is just trying to get us to shift our focus, shift our awareness, our perception. He said if, in verse 30, If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith, you of little trust, you of little perception, you of little awareness. Therefore, don't worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek, for your Father knows that you need all these things. So he knows that you've got a need. Now, how's he going to supply it? All right, here's how he's going to supply it. 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you're worrying about, all jacked up about, all, all, all anxious about. He said, seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. One witty invention. One witty invention added to you as you, as you begin to be open, begin to look and see things that you never saw before. Now, so... Is could God give you what you need, but He just isn't doing it? I've heard people say a lot, a lot many times, and this really got to wear it on me. I've heard people say God's delays are not God's denials. I, I I've come to where I don't like that phrase because what it says to me, to me personally, when you say God's delays are not God's denials, what you're doing is saying I need to do something. God's held up because of me, because, because I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm messing up someplace. My faith isn't good. I'm missing the mark someplace. Here's the truth. Everything that God will ever provide for you, which is everything you need, everything you'll ever need, already been created in six days. He's entered into a rest. He's still resting. It's already been created. Everything that God ever created that you'll ever need is in the kingdom, and the kingdom, Jesus said, is within you. So let me take some pressure off this morning. You don't have to press into the things of God. You don't have to, you don't have to birth anything. You don't have to travail and groan and moan. You don't have to birth anything that he's doing because he's already done it. You don't need to break through this morning. What you need is an eye-opener. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, this, I think we've taken this scripture and, and we've made it be something that it really isn't. John chapter 4, I used to hear this in the context of evangelism all the time. I don't think it has anything to do with evangelism. John chapter 4 and verse 34. <clears throat> Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. My will is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white with harvest. Now we've taken that evangelistic context. Let me just tell you, I think he's talking about his completed will. Now everything that we'll ever need is already, is already standing there. It's ready to come to us. I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. There, everything is there. The harvest is already ready. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. He did all the sowing. He did all the heavy lifting. He did the work. And now you're getting the benefit. And it's exactly what he tells us in verse 38. I sent you to reap for what you did not labor. Others have labored and you've entered into their labors. The father's done all the laboring. He's got the field ready. It's white to harvest. It's, it's ready to bring in. Are, are you seeing that? It's not about evangelism. It's talking about what he has already provided. Raise your consciousness. Raise your perception. Do you see the fields are already ripe for you to, to meet every need, every obligation that you have in life? Do you know why God gets all the glory? Because he's done all, all of the labor. That's what those verses are saying. He's done all the labor, and now you're getting benefits from what you had nothing to do with. He's done it for you. So he's not, he's not holding back. That second question, do you think God could give you something but holding back on it? No, he's, he's got the fields white. He's saying this is how you handle it. This is how you do it. Question number three, do you think... You can do certain things to change God's mind. Can you influence God? Can you twist his arm somehow? If we, if we could, then all the times that you said, man, let's call the prayer chain. Let's call him. If we could just get enough people to pray, can we, can we influence God? Can we fast just a little bit more? Can I need to call people? Well, let's gather. We're going to fight the devil, evil forces that are holding this back. We spent all our time in awareness of the problem that we perceived as evil or was religious tradition. And those things have affected the way we think. 
All three of those questions are based on appearances. All three of those questions are based on perception. They're based on outer world observations. How about if we just enter the rest? That's our labor. How about if we just begin to meditate on our oneness with him? Now, if you answered yes to any of those questions, any of those three questions, then maybe I should just say a word to you about supply. I think you're confused about what supply is. A yes, indi a yes indicates that you don't, you're not really convinced that you have what you need, that you're still needing something that you don't have. Let me, let me give you a parable of Jesus to illustrate this. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And let me, let me just read the first eight verses. You're probably familiar with this. Let me point some things out. I think, I think sometimes we have a misunderstanding about what supply is. Supply is in the invisible. Everything you'll ever need, the supply, the totality of supply has been created, setting in the kingdom, and the kingdom is within. <clears throat> Jesus said, I'm the vine, John 15, 1. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes out, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. You're already prepared. You already got everything you need. You're clean through the word which I've spoken. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, neither unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You're abiding in him this morning. So there's no reason that we're not bringing from the invisible to the visible. Now hang on. Verse 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I him will bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast as a branch withered. He's not connected to life. They gather them, throw them into fire. Got to get purified. The fire is an agent of purification to get you to a place where you can bear much fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire. It shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so you shall be my disciples. Father's not holding anything back. He's glorified when we bear much fruit. Now listen, I want you to get a good understanding of supply this morning. I need, I need to keep moving right along. All right, we have some mis mis misconceptions about what supply is. The food that you ate, the money that you spent this week, they're not supply. They're not supply. They are the fruit of supply. They're the fruit of supply. Supply is invisible. Right? You, you cannot see in this pair, Jesus spells it out so well. You cannot see the work of the vine to the branch. Now follow me along for just a few minutes. The, promise, the problem with most of us is we don't think we have any supply until it's visible and tangible and we can put our hands on it. Let me say it again. Supply is invisible. This parable in John chapter 15, the, the, the grapevine parable, you eat the grapes, you make the juice, but the supply is always at work. The supply is not the grapes that grow on the vine. The grapes are the result of the supply. The supply is always at work in the vine, always, 24-7. The vine is at work supplying everything that could ever come to the branch, and all the branch does is bear the fruit of the vine. The work is done in the vine. But we, we, just, we just read... From the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, Don't worry about stuff. Your Father knows that you have need. He's already supplied it. Now we just read red word. The Father gets great glory when you manifest the fruit of the supply. He is the supply. Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. He's at work 24 7. No, notice we never say fruit of the branch. You, you never say the apples, it's the fruit of the on the branches. We say it's an apple tree. It's a great vine. It's the fruit of the vine. Here, here, here's the point. I, want, I, want, I hope you're not hearing this with physical ears. I want you to hear this with spiritual ears this morning. Get spiritual perception. 
supply always begins in the root system. It comes up through the vine, out to the branches, and then in the right season, at the right time, the grapes appear on the branches. The branch didn't labor. Jesus said, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna harvest in a field for which you did not do the work, but you're getting the benefit. He's, I'm here today to tell you this morning that because of the finished work of the cross of Jesus, that the benefits of life that you so deeply desire belong to you, have been provided for you, and we're now just learning how to grab onto them and manifest them. You are a transitional generation that is going to push the ball down the field as heaven invades earth. You're going to begin to demonstrate and do things you never thought possible. The supply, the work of the Father, the kingdom is at work within you, even when you don't realize it, even when you don't do it, know it. You know how that supply comes? Here's how the Father works the supply as the vine to you the branch so that you can bear much fruit. The supply is working within you. It comes, it comes in the form of this. The Holy Spirit leads you. Spirit of truth directs you. It guides you. It speaks to you. It prompts you. You get a Holy Spirit hunch. Ever had a hunch? Man, you just knew that you knew that you knew. That's the supply working towards you. You're meditating. You're sitting in quietness, thinking on the omnipresence of the Father, that his presence has surrounded you and it fills you and it's flowing out of you. You're thinking about the unseen. You're, you're using your imagination. You're seeing the things that you really desire. And all of a sudden, a thought comes to you. Here's a tremendous need that people have. Here's how you can fill it. That's what Proverbs 8, 12 was talking about, a witty invention. You, you hit that witty invention, he's going to show you it's God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He'll show you how to do it. He'll put you in touch with the right people. And so it's your resting in him. It's being still in his presence. It's meditating on him, realizing that you're one spirit with the Lord. Man, you cannot exhaust that meditation on being one spirit with the Lord and what that actually means, what that enables you to, what doors that opens for you. That's what waters the roots and, and fertilizes and prepares the branch for a good harvest. You want to get really prepared for a good harvest, that grapes appearing, great big old clumps, Remember when, when, when the spies went out, Joshua and Caleb come back, and they had to carry the, 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 the grapes on a pole between two men carrying them, they were so big. You talk about a harvest that you can't contain. And this comes through, this comes through your spending quiet time with him. I'm not talking about blab it and grab it. I'm not talking about word of faith. Somebody messaged me, say, ah, you sound like you're doing word of faith. No, I have nothing to do with word of faith. I'm talking about the kingdom that is within you, tapping the resources through the time of intimacy that you spend with the Father. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is in the invisible supply. So it's our awareness, it's our consciousness that creates the flow from the vine to the branches. You know what that does? Man, when you tap into that, that produces a peace. Jesus said, don't take thought what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. He said, your father's taking care of all that. You tap into this, it creates a peace. It eliminates stress. It eliminates worry. Do you know where worry comes from? Worry comes because you don't know the result of something, and so you fret. Jesus said, take no thought. When we worry, the moment you worry, if you haven't heard anything I said this morning, when you worry, you leave the invisible dimension and you walk back into that seen reality that is a lie and a deception, and you begin to Take thought. Jesus said, don't take thought. Worry, your focus is on the invisible. All of a sudden, the circumstances catch your attention. So you move out of the invisible to the visible to that circumstance. And now you don't know how things are going to work. The things look like they're negative. And so you start to fret and you start to worry. You live, you move, you have your being in the vine who knows the end from the beginning. 
Can I say it again? He has supplied all you need to get you safely, successfully to the very end. So all we do like branches, all we do is be aware and focus on the invisible supply. And that supply comes through the leading, the directing, the guiding, the responding. And as you do that, you begin to bear the tangible fruit of that invisible supply. All right, here's what we're talking about this morning. Here's what we're talking about. We're talking about changing our reality by changing our perception. When your perception moves into what you do not see with your physical eyes, your perception moves into that which is eternal. Your perception moves to the source that the vine delivers. You know what? That's what we call renewing our mind. Don't be transformed. Be renewed by the, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're not of this world. You're not of this dimension. You're not limited to this supply. You're not limited to what the world can provide you. You have the wisdom of God. You know what? Those witty, those witty inventions, that's just sticking with me for some reason because I believe you have a creator. The creator lives as you. The, the creator made you in his image and likeness. Shouldn't we be creators? A witty invention is a creator. You're making something in the visible that was never seen before. How does a, how does a, re, a renewed mind look? And I'm done. I'm done. This... <laughs> I've covered so much ground this morning, I'm almost embarrassed. How does a renewed mind look as it transitions from the seen to the unseen? Or as Paul said, we walk by faith, we walk by trust, the one that promised it, the one that has brought us this far is going to enable it. Faithful is he that began a good work will complete it. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. All right, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to give you a scripture to meditate. I haven't done this in a long time. I'm going to give you a passage of scripture that we're going to tie into next week where we left off this week. All right, so I want you to look at Romans chapter 4. That's Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 25. And we're going to take it up next week. I, I, I beseech you, brethren, go back and listen to this again. There's so much meat in this. This is so transforming. I'm telling you, God has got us onto some things that are unbelievable. My, mind's, my mind is being blown by what the, the Father's doing in the earth today. We are on the cutting edge, the cusp of some things that generations have looked for. And man, I'm telling you what, I am happy to make this journey with you. 2024 is going to be an awesome year. We're going places we never fathomed before. And it comes as we get our right perception and the focus in the place we need to. Our lives are being changed. Our minds are being renewed as we change our perception. All right, God bless you. See you back next week. That's Matthew, or I'm sorry, Romans 4, 13 to 25. Chew it up. Get every bit you can out of that. And we're going to get into it next week. See you then. If your heart has been touched by Don Keithley's words, and you believe this ministry can enrich your spiritual journey, we warmly invite you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with all the new and inspiring content from the Digital Cathedral, ensuring you never miss out on the transformative power of God's love and grace. You may make a donation at donkeithley.com. We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.